listening to the international hit show, The Baby Names Podcast. And here are your hosts, the Moss Sisters. I'm Jennifer Moss. And I'm Mallory Moss Cat. And we're the founders of babynames.com. And we're sisters, too. We are. I used to be the baby of the family for five whole years. And then I came around. Yep. You ruined my shtick. Ha ha. <laughs> so we start each episode with interesting names we've found since the last episode. And I went to our names of the day. Each day, our computer chooses a random name of the day from our database. They're posted on our homepage and all of our social accounts every day. This week, we've had some interesting ones. Carnation, which Uh. kind of follows that whole flower theme. Camden, with a Y. Kirstein, which is like a crossover between Kirsten and Christine. I'm not sure that I really like that one. Nadim, which is Arabic for drinking companion. Hmm. Keisha or Cassia, which is a form of acacia, like the tree. And Marit or Maret, which is a Dutch form of our mother's name, Margaret. Ooh, I like Cassia. I do not, however, like Carnation. Why not? Or is it Carnation? (laughs) I think it's Carnation. (laughs) I'm warning you guys. I'm being uber honest today, so watch out. No holds barred. Interesting names that I found include Ainsley, A-Y-N-S-L-E-Y, Chip, and Marquita. Marquita. I knew a Chip, but it was a nickname for Charles. And I think it's also historically been used for juniors, like chip off the old block. And we'll have to do an episode on generational suffixes and nicknames. That'll be a good one. All right. Put it on the list. Okay. This week's topic is not for expecting parents, but maybe name enthusiasts. But it does have to do with names. We get a lot of authors and aspiring writers to our website looking to name their characters. You know that I'm an author with four mystery books published, and I also teach a class on writing fiction. Of course, that class would not be complete without a lesson on naming your characters. It's one of my favorite lessons. So, the first thing I do in this lesson is I ask the class, who names your characters? Mal, pretend you're a writer. Who names your characters? I do. I'm the writer. Nope. Go a little deeper. You're creating this whole world where all of your characters have their own lives, their backstories, their families, their parents. All right, all right. So the parents name their characters. Yeah, the characters' parents name them. That's how you have to think to be authentic. So many new and old writers make the mistake of naming characters as they would name a baby, their own baby. A lot of people already have a list of favorite baby names and they just can't wait to use it on somebody or something. But the problem with that is that they tend to be names that are trending now for babies. So when you use them on a character that's, say, 20, 30, or 40 years old, it's incongruent. Now, that's not so much of an issue with classic names like Laura or David, for example, because those pretty much stay in style. But a good example, I was watching Manifest last night, a television show, where they have a teenage character named Olive. And the name Olive only started coming into style the last five years or so. It just hit the top 1,000 in 2007. So unless the writer puts in a good reason for the character having that name, like maybe she's named after her grandmother or something, then it will kind of pop out as inauthentic. There were also two young kids in the series, Dexter, that were named Bobby and Susie. And I was like, wait, what year is this? That would have been appropriate for maybe 1962, but not 2009. So the writer was definitely showing his or her age. So are you saying to be aware of the popular names in any given year? Like the year your character is born? Yeah. 
My first tip is to research the names that were popular around the year your character is to be born. Now, this is assuming that it's not a fantasy set in the future, but we'll get to that a little later. Now, remember, prior to 1975 or 1980, most parents, here in the United States at least, wanted to conform to the most popular names. One out of every three babies born in 1950 had a top ten name. We also tend to identify age by certain names that were popular in any given decade. A Susie or a Dick, for example, is probably over 50. Exactly. So if you want the reader to have a mental image of someone older, the name is a great way to start. I can see this being especially important for historical fiction. Definitely. The U.S. Social Security baby names records go back to 1880. But if you want to go further back or research another country, a great resource is your favorite, the Ancestry Sites. Absolutely. There you can view phone books, ship manifests, census records, and so much more. A very fertile place to find character names. Yeah. So let's get back to the character's parents. So a child's name reflects the parent's background, their ethnicity, their current geographical location, their family history, and even their personality. So if the parents were like hippies in the 70s, they might have named their child Sunflower or Peace Shadow. A name can be a really great piece of backstory for your character, so I advise all writers to take time and do it right. Clark Richards. Still naming people Clark, huh? I might be the last one. I was named after my grandfather. Fair enough. Pretty sure I'm named after a stripper my dad knew. That was an excerpt from The Passage on Fox with characters Shauna Babcock and Clark Richards, a great example of how the writers give a little backstory on their names. She says, they're still naming people Clark, huh? And he says he's named after his grandfather. And then she says, yeah, well, I'm pretty sure I was named after a stripper that my father knew. Cool. Okay. Well, what other tips do you have? I know that we've kind of abandoned this in real life, but in fiction, it still holds. You should make names easy to pronounce. Because as the reader is reading through your book, you don't want them to stop and wonder how to pronounce a name because that takes them out of the story. Even though they're pronouncing it in their head, they will stop and stumble over something like Zix for Megaziz. Zix for Megaziz, huh? (laughs) But what about science fiction? Don't you want the characters to sound like they're from out of this world? Well, actually, the very best sci-fi authors name their characters with easy-to-pronounce names, even if they're completely fabricated and don't yet exist on Earth in real life, like Catelyn Stark, Sandor Clegane, Benjen, Theon, or Daenerys from Game of Thrones. Okay, I see your point. Like Anakin, Han, and Darth Vader... And Obi-Wan Kenobi from Star Wars, Bilbo Baggins, Arwen, Gandalf, Gollum, Frodo, characters from Tolkien. Yeah, they sound like they could be real Earth names. Even if you look at Star Trek characters, non-human, it follows the same rule. Brunt, Kamara, T'Pring, Uhura, and Saru from the current Star Trek Discovery. And you know what? Speaking of Star Trek Discovery, which I have just binged, and I'm watching the new season now, it's interesting that creator Brian Fuller gave the female protagonist a traditionally male name, Michael Burnham. They briefly mention it in the script when Tilly says, I've only known one other woman with the name Michael, and it turns out to be her anyway. And I was a little disappointed, as if they needed the male name to make her strong or something. There are two actresses I know named Michael. Four-time Emmy winner Michael Learned, who played the mom on the oh, Walton. yeah. Uh-huh. And Michael Michelle from ER, whose real name is Michael Michelle Williams. And I had a nursing teacher, actually, who was a female Michael also. Wow, cool. Did you ask her about it? 
No, I didn't. It was oh. before baby names. Oh, I see. Well, I looked it up, and Brian Fuller is a veteran TV writer and has a long history of doing this with his female characters. If you remember the series Dead Like Me, Ellen Muth played the main female character named George. In another of his series, Pushing Daisies, actress Anna Feel plays a woman named Chuck. And as far as the TV show Hannibal goes, well, the characters were named by the book author, Thomas Harris. But Fuller did cast a woman as Freddie Lowndes, the reporter, played by Lara Jean Choristecki. Ooh, Hannibal was such a gruesome but good show. It had a lame ending, though. I think it was just told to end, so they had to come up with something abruptly. But I think it should have just stuck with the books, which were amazing. Agreed. Half the time I had my hands over my eyes, but I still loved the show. The music. Remember the classical music they would integrate? And Mm -hmm. the writing. Anyway, more tips for naming fictional characters. Be careful you don't use similar names in your cast of characters because it might confuse the reader. For example, Rich and Rick. Make sure that at least your main characters' names are different enough so people can uniquely identify them in their heads as they're reading. Also, when you're naming siblings, remember they have the same parents, so they should be sort of the same type of name. So, for example, another bad example, in the TV show Breaking Bad, there were sisters Skylar and Marie. And I didn't quite buy that naming convention. Those are very different types of names. Hold on. In our family, there's a Susan, Kate, Jennifer, which are very traditional names. And then me, Mallory, which pretty much broke that rule. And you were born in 1968, where it was kind of suddenly okay for women to have their own ideas, to break out of the mold, and it was the beginning of unique names coming into style. It also reflected the change in mom's power because she found the women's movement right around that time. And remember, your name was traditionally male. So in a way, it was her giving you the same power as a man. Hmm, I never thought of that. Go now, as she would say. (laughs) Yeah, so if you were to be a character in my book, I would definitely have put that backstory in there somewhere. Otherwise, naming a character Mallory after Susan, Kate, and Jennifer would not quite compute. And the other thing that I teach in my writing class is that fiction has to make more sense than reality. Reality can be crazy and unpredictable, and fiction, ironically, has to be believable. You haven't named a character after me, have you? Not yet, but I have used the last names of many of my friends as well as some family names. Are you allowed to do that? With their permission, yes. And I personally only use a first or a last name, but never give them the exact first and last name of someone I know. And I will ask the person if I can use their name and kind of describe the character to them so they're not embarrassed by it or anything. I get everything, all of their consent in writing also, just in case that nothing can kick me in the butt later. And they said, I never gave you permission. Um, I even asked my daughter, Miranda, if I could name a petulant pop star character after her. She was a teenager at the time and wanted to be a pop star, so I formulated a fun character called Mandy Ross after Miranda Moss, and she thought it was pretty funny. So what are some good examples of character naming other than the ones we've already discussed? Well, one thing I love is when the writer has fun with the names. A great example of this is the television series Arrested Development. The main character, played by Jason Bateman, is Michael Bluth. That's a very common name since he is the straight man. His twin sister, Lindsay, played by Portia de Rossi, it also is a popular name. However, her married last name is Funky. It's like funky with an umlaut. And so the craziness begins. Michael's son is named George Michael, and they call him George Michael throughout the series, and they always say, not the singer. Lindsay's daughter is named Maybe, and even though they are cousins, George Michael has a crush on her, and there's always a, quote, maybe on whether they will get together. Okay, gross. Yeah, I know. 
Michael's oldest brother is George Bluth Jr., but they call him Job, spelled G-O-B, like gob, for his initials. His other brother is Buster Bluth, which is just funny because he's a mama's boy and frightened and fragile, so he's exact opposite of a Buster. The mother's name is Lucille, and her best friend is also named Lucille, who they call Lucille, too, played by Liza Minnelli. They're basically frenemies. So anyway, the writers have so much fun naming the characters, even the minor characters, like one of my favorites, the attorney Robert Loblaw, played by Scott Bayo. What's so funny about that? Well, he goes by Bob, so say his first and last name. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Look up his fake commercial on YouTube. It's hysterical. And they also have a district attorney on the most current season named Lottie Dottie. So she's Lottie Dottie, comma, D-A. Lottie Dottie da. Yep. <laughs> ben Stiller plays a magician named Tony Wonder. Other characters include Cindy Light Balloon, J. Walter Weatherman, and so on and so on. And because the show is so farcical, these crazy character names just work. So, John, what about the characters in your mystery series? I assume you put a lot of thought behind those. Of course I did. And even each book in the series has a comedic or plot element around names. So, for example, in my first book, Town Red, one of the suspects, Todd Elliott, is originally named Todd Elliott Spanks, but he dropped his last name because it was so embarrassing. In the most recent book, Friend of the Family, a guy claims to be the long-lost brother of my protagonist, Detective Ryan. Ryan looks at this guy's ID and sees that his name is Devin Joseph Doherty. Well, Ryan knows that his family naming convention was that the kids had to have an Irish name and it had to end in N. So he's Ryan and his sisters are Siobhan, Aaron, and Finn. So Devin fits the naming convention. Also, his middle name is Joseph, which is Ryan's father's name. So taking all this into account, Ryan doesn't readily dismiss him. So is Devin his long lost brother? You'll have to read the book to find out. You named your lead female character after our great-grandmother, Catherine Lulling. Why'd you do that? Well, I've always loved her name, and I thought it was so feminine and evocative of someone who's beautiful and ethereal. You know, lulling is a dictionary word. It's a verb which means calming. And Catherine in my series is a new agey kind of psychic empath and just a little elusive. So the name just fit. Now I spelled her name a little differently because I didn't want it to be the same as our sister Kate's because she's not named after Kate. And where can people find your books, Jennifer? Woohoo! Town Red, Way to Go, Taking the Rap, and Friend of the Family are all available on Barnes & Noble, BN.com, or Amazon.com. Published by Black Opal Books. If you like mysteries with a little metaphysical twist, check them out. Thank you very much. As far as my favorite naming in books, I think the Harry Potter books by J.K. Rowling use the best naming conventions somehow they sounded exactly like the character's personality without being too over the top oh. so of course there's the hero harry heroine hermione granger hero harry heroine hermione almost the exact same letters yes and ron weasley who grows from a weasley scared boy to a strong super heroic young man Ooh. And of the bad guys, of course, there's Draco Malfoy, Severus Snape, or is he bad? And someone who is so evil, you can't even say his name. Okay, I'll say it anyway. Lord Volda. <laughs> okay, so I won't say it. And, well, I must say there is a character that I just have to call out from Harry Potter, whose name is so mellifluous that it has become more popular since the Harry Potter books and movies have come out. And can you guess what that name is? Well, I've never read them, and I've only watched the first movie, but it better not be a Luna. What are you talking about? I was going to say Nymphadora Tonks. <laughs> that is totally your nickname now of the week. Nympha. 
Then you are la di da di da. Deal. Okay, for my full recommendations on naming characters and my analysis on books and TV show character names, visit characternames.com. And if you're a writer and have questions about naming your characters, don't hesitate to email us at podcast at babynames.com. And now it's time for Celebrity Baby News. Well, it's no contest here. The biggest celebrity baby news since our last podcast is that American Idol winner and famous country singer Carrie Underwood and her hockey-playing hubby, Mike Fisher, just welcomed their second boy to the family. They named him Jacob Bryan, with a Y, just like Brian Fuller. Jacob is Hebrew in origin and means supplanter. Jacob joins big brother Isaiah Michael, who turns four in March. Very biblical name choices there. And now in political news. Just kidding. Just kidding. (laughs) Congratulations to former first daughter Chelsea Clinton and hubby Mark Mezvinsky for their announcement that they are expecting baby number three. The baby who is due this summer will follow big brother Aiden, age two, and oldest sister Charlotte, age four. Very popular names. Now, celebrity kids keep growing up and having babies. This week, it's Alexa Penavega from Spy Kids, who announced that she and her husband, Carlos, of big-time Rush fame, are expecting their second child. Their first baby was a boy whom they named Ocean. What do you think about Ocean, Mal? Maybe the next one will be River. Or Sky. Anywho, and other interesting what were they thinking baby name news, fans are spreading the news that perhaps Jessica Simpson is going to name her new daughter Birdie. This is because photos with the words Birdie's Nest behind them were taken at Jessica's baby shower recently. Well, I must say that I like Birdie a whole lot more than I like Maxwell for a girl's name, which is what she named her first daughter. Are you seriously kidding me? Birdie is a nickname. It also has connotations of being little, and it's diminutive with the I-E at the end. I hope that's just what they're calling her in the womb, because Birdie is a terrible name. Maxwell, on the other hand, is not horrible for a girl. It's a strong crossover name. Anyway, another Jessica, Jessica Rain, who played Jenny on Call the Midwife, has announced that she and her husband, Tom Goodman Hill, are expecting. You know, the show wasn't really the same after Jenny left, and it made no sense since it was supposed to be narrated by her, but whatevs. Those are my rants of the day. No birdies! Well, you're cranky. (laughs) Anyway, more babies from across the pond. British actors Tom Hardy and Charlotte Riley have a brand new baby boy who they named Forrest. So, Jennifer, can you guess who they named him after? Babies are like a box of chocolates. You never know which one is gonna stink like. Okay, okay, okay. Angelina Presley of the Pistol Annies sang her way to mamahood once again when she gave birth to a little baby girl on January 22nd with husband Jordan Powell. This is Angelina's second child, but first with Jordan. Her son Jed is 12 years old. Jed like and clamp it. I know that's an old reference, but still, Jed, what is this one going to be? Ellie Mae? Oh, yeah. You're in rare form today. <laughs> really didn't get much sleep, did you? No, and I'm cranky. Elizabeth, well, how do you pronounce this last name? Pothast? Pothast? Pothast, maybe? And- I don't know. And Andrei Kastovet of 90 Day Fiancé. You know what? 90 Day (laughs) Fiancé. I'm not even going to read this. It's not news and no one cares. So they had a baby. Big deal. What's your next one, Jen? Yeah, no faux celebs here, please. This one might be on the line, though. Celebrity wedding planner David Tutera and husband Joey Toth, or Toth, welcome their new baby girl on January 24th, named Gracie Stella. (coughs) Another nickname. Stop it, people, okay? 
Reportedly, the name Stella was after Joey's beloved Polish grandmother and his mother. That's pretty sweet. Why didn't they just do Stella Gracie then? I don't know. Anyway, Gracie follows in the footsteps of her big sister Cielo, Cielo, who is five years old. Now, Cielo is beautiful. It means sky or heaven. Say good night, Gracie. Oh my goodness. Well, that's it, Gracie. Well, that's it, Gracie. Now it's time for letters from you, our listeners. Why don't you take the first one, Mal? Okay. Hello, Mallory and Jennifer. I love the podcast. I'm 14 and obsessed with names. Hooray! I've been listening to the podcast since the beginning along with a friend. I love learning about new names and keep my favorite recorded in a notebook. I was wondering your opinion on a few names that I'm considering for a book character. Oh, cool. So far, I have Haven Winder or Winder as my main, Aaron as one of the guys, and I'm playing with the name Scarletta. I'd love to know your opinions and any suggestions. Thanks, CV. Well, I kind of like the name Scarletta. I think it should definitely be a femme fatale. Well, it reminds me of Scarlet Letta, you know, <laughs> so if it's kind of a combination of the Scarlet Letta, which was an A for adulteress, if you remember the book back from your school days. So I really like the name too, but I hope she does have a little evil in her. Or Scarlet O'Hara. Yeah, but I like that it's not just Scarlet, that it's just a little different and memorable. Mm-hmm. I'd like to know what the book is about. or like Exactly. If, is it science fiction? Is Haven female? Is Haven male? Maybe it doesn't matter. Haven Winder or Haven Winder is a great first and last name, and it's pretty memorable too. So I mm-hmm. like these mm-hmm. names. I don't know about Aaron. Maybe he's the... You know, the main guy, the protagonist, and that's a good, solid biblical name. So I'd say you're on the right track, CV. Keep going and give us a little more information about the story and the genre, and we can better give you our opinion. And I think it's really cool that you're writing at 14. Keep it up. I think that's so cool. Yeah, I used to teach a teen class, too, and it was just so amazing what they would come up with these these stories, a lot of fantasy and historical drama. I'm like, oh my God, I loved teaching kids. And now on to our second letter. Hello, I have listened to all of your podcasts trying to find inspiration for our next baby name. We have one boy, Jace, who will be 17 months when our second boy arrives sometime in April. The dilemma is trying to find a second boy name. Since they will be close in age, I want something that is not close to Jace, but I also love one-syllable names. I'm not sure why, I just like simple names. I recently thought of the name Hux. I like Hux better than Huxley. It would be Hux Holcomb. What do you think of this name? Do you have any other one-syllable name suggestions? Thank you so much, Chelsea. I actually like Hux Holcomb. I don't know. Talk about a character name. Hux is cute. I think it's tough. Hux and Jace are similar names. They're both on the unusual side, although Jace is becoming a lot more popular lately. Mm -hmm. What do you think of Hux Holcomb? I don't like Hux. I would rather you use Huck. Um, Although both of them rhyme with something that you really don't want to rhyme with. What does Hux rhyme with? Oh, you can't say that. I know I can't say that. I'll bleep it out. But anyway, you know, it also reminds me of the Huxtables. And so that reminds me of Bill Cosby. And there's all that kind of crap going on. So I wouldn't use Hux. I would, if you wanted to use Huck... That is becoming a little more popular. Um, Wasn't there a writer named Aldous Huxley, too? Right. But I do love the alliteration. So I would stay with the H's and use an H name with Holcomb. Let me look some up really quickly. If you didn't know, you can search by syllable and first letter on babynames.com. Let's see what it comes up with. 
While you're doing that, Aldous Huxley was an English writer and philosopher, and he wrote Brave New World about a dystopian future. Hans. Hans. Hans Holcomb? No thanks. (laughs) I love that. No. Hanes, as in the pantyhose. That's underwear, Hanes. Hud. Hud Holcomb. How? How? How do you spell that? How funny. It's H-O-W-E, like the surname. There's Holt, which is a great alternative to Colt. Holt Holcomb is kind of cute. <laughs> Holt Holcomb is kind of hard to say. There's also Ham, which is an older name. No, Ham. And then there's one of my favorites and your cat. Hank. Hank Holcomb. That's awesome. Hank Holcomb. I would go for Hank and or Henry Holcomb and call him Hank. Henry Holcomb. Maybe Hank. I like that. Herb. Herb Holcomb. No, not Herb. I have a friend who just named her new baby Chester Marvin. Really? Two very, very old-fashioned names. So I guess it's making its way over to the boys' side now, these hundred-year-old names. Chester Marvin. That's a shame. Why? I like Chester. Call him Chet. I'm sorry. That's a shame. Hoyt is another one. I like Hoyt. Like Hoyt from True Blood. Hoyt Holcomb. That's kind of hard to say, though. But anyway, I'd look for a couple alternatives to Hux. I don't think it would be terrible. I don't think he would be traumatized. Just my personal preference. Well, there you go. There you go. Thanks, Chelsea and CV for writing in this week. All righty. And thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss an episode. If you want to surreptitiously binge on our previous episodes at work, you can find them at babynames.com slash podcast. Or you can listen to them in the car, but drive safely. I know you'll just be rolling over with laughter. Because Jennifer is such a wag. You're lying, wag. Oh, hold on. Uh, And tune in next time when we discuss love names in terms of endearment. Just in time for Valentine's Day. I hate Valentine's Day. You are cranky, la di da di da Okay, say goodnight, Nympha. Good night, Nympha. Bye, guys. Bye. We love you.